tell me myself. All right, here we are at day four of the gut health challenge, the fall gut health challenge. And I'm going to share a little bit with you today, more on the microbiome, more on the um, gut health and hormones. And the biggest one, the biggest factor of all probably related to gut health is stress. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So as far as the microbiome goes, which is just the name that we give to the collection of microbes that live in our gut. And again, we are more microbial DNA than we are human DNA. So we are like a walking interaction of microorganisms and it really does impact our health, the health of that microbial life that's living in our gut. So we want to feed those organisms in a way that like we think about feeding ourselves. So ideally we want a robust community of microbes living in there. We want lots of variation and that's because all of the different bugs have jobs that they do for us to keep us healthy and vice versa. So when we have a more robust or diverse microbiome, more jobs can be performed that are reflected as in our bodies as overall good health. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. So the basic idea is that we want to have more beneficial bacteria in our gut than harmful microorganisms. And when this gets out of balance, the term that we give it is called dysbiosis. So that term only means that you don't have enough good bacteria or you have an overgrowth of good bacteria, which can also be harmful and uh, not, not a great uh, community of healthy bugs living in there that are able to fight against any harmful organisms that come our way. And so when this happens, this is a good, a reason that gut permeability occurs, poor nutrient absorption. If we don't have a healthy microbiome, it affects our immunity because 70 to 80% of our immunity is located in our gut. And so if we don't have wonderful, diverse microorganisms living there, our immune system will not be as healthy we become inflamed in our gut and then that leaks out into the reflected in the whole body will become inflamed. Depression and anxiety because the gut microbiome is responsible for neurotransmitter production. So if we don't have healthy microbes living in our gut, we're not able to produce the hormones in our body that make us feel good. Uh, and resistant weight loss is another one. So certain organisms have been identified as being helpful for us from a metabolic perspective and helping us with our metabolism and synthesizing uh, like fats, for example, and getting them to become stored in the body or used the way that we want them to be used to give us energy. And I can just show you here, this is the GI map test that I use to evaluate someone's microbiome. And these commensal or keystone bacteria are the ones that are really well studied that we know have specific jobs in our bodies that we want them to do so that we can be healthy. One of my favorites is acromancia. Here you can see I put a little wiggly circle around it with an arrow. And acromancia, when we have low levels of acromancia, this is a good example of one that can lead to resistant weight loss um, if we don't have adequate numbers of acromancia. So this microbe job day in and day out is really just to build healthy gut lining for us and help us with our metabolism. So when we don't have enough acromancia, which we can see like practically undetectable on this test result, we have a poor gut lining, poor metabolism, and resistant weight loss. However, when this black needle comes to the other side and we have too much acromancia, it's associated with dementia and metabolic syndrome. So things like diabetes and things like that. And what can cause too much acromancia? Well, low stomach acid is number one. We've talked about that lots and lots. 
and high carbs or high sugar diet because you're just overfeeding this organism. And when it overgrows, like I said, it can cause neurologic problems and problems with metabolic health. So the idea is that what we're eating is feeding these organisms. We want to preferentially feed these good guys. We would want all of them to be in the green range and we don't want to overfeed them because that has negative consequences as well. And the whole point of that is that we are what we eat. So whatever we eat is feeding all of those microorganisms the good guys will eat healthy foods, a poor diet, like a standard American diet full of white foods like sugar and white flour and processed foods will preferentially feed organisms that are not doing anything to help us with our health. In fact, it's the opposite. So what kinds of things that are pretty practical can we do to help us maintain a healthy microbiome? Again, we want to eat that diverse whole foods diet. 80% of the time is the goal. It doesn't have to be perfection. Every single choice that we make matters. A spartame preferentially kills the good bacteria in our gut. So diet soda is, you know, a nice treat, but poison in a can pretty much. So fizzy water, like sparkling water, like those laquas are pretty good. Um, so something other than an aspartame containing drink, hydration is really important. We want to minimize, we want to maintain our adequate stomach acid, and we can determine whether or not we have that just by doing that stomach acid challenge with some apple cider vinegar, a tablespoon mixed in a little bit of water with a meal. And if we don't experience heartburn symptoms from that, we know that added acid into our diet when we eat a protein containing meal is really helpful for breaking down foods and helping us absorb all the nutrients that those foods are offering. Alcohol, um, you know, it's wonderful and fun and not the best for the gut. So we just want to keep that in moderation. Fiber, eating fiber containing foods is really helpful because that's fuel, those bacteria. We don't digest the food ourselves, the fiber that's in food, but the bacteria work with it for us, particularly the soluble fiber and the byproduct. When the bacteria eat fiber, creates a fuel source for our intestinal lining. So it's critical. And I take this as a supplement. If you're interested in a supplement form of soluble fiber, it's wonderful. Food first approach is always good. And if you have questions about what foods are high in, in fiber, let me know. Oat bran is probably the highest food in soluble fiber. Um, fermented foods are awesome because they're full of bacteria themselves, like um, even sourdough bread, even though it's cooked is an example of uh, like a fermented food or kombucha is a good one. You can find cottage cheese that's uh, got good microbes in it. It's a little bit more expensive, but some of them are really good, uh, full of probiotics, yogurt, and things like that. So focusing on fermented foods is great. If you notice that when you eat fermented foods, you have a reaction to them, that's a signal either of histamine intolerance or maybe microbial overgrowth in the gut if you start to get really bloated when you're eating fermented foods. Taking a good probiotic is, is a wonderful thing to do for your microbiome because it helps to keep more good bacteria than bad bacteria residing in there. And that's the whole goal is that we just want to establish like uh, a, a, a robust team of microorganisms. And so if we can add to that by taking a probiotic, it's wonderful. I think it is interesting and good to know that when you take probiotics, those organisms do not become like an established part of your own ecosystem. It's just that they you're taking up a place with the probiotics, but if you were to stop taking it, for example, it's not like those probiotics that you were taking built a home in your intestines. They typically don't. We want them to stick there and hang out while we're taking them and do a job for us, but it's just good to know that they don't permanently live there after you've taken a probiotic. Prebiotics are foods that feed the good bugs in the gut, the probiotics. 
I put inulin in parentheses here. I actually will buy um, like Jerusalem artichokes are a good example of something that's a great prebiotic fiber. And uh, embarrassingly, I just buy mine on Amazon. It comes in the powdered form and I just add that to tea or water. It's kind of sweet tasting. Um, and that's a great way to get more prebiotics and more of that soluble fiber. It's very easy to do. Um, I can put a link in the group today for a prebiotic such as inulin powder can make you a little gassy. So just start low and go slow with that. Avoiding the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and Tylenol when possible, because those uh, do cause gut permeability. And then we'll talk more about stress management as well. I did touch on this already, but I just think it's so fascinating when I do labs for people who are having hormonal imbalances, because we do the hormone labs based on a person's cycle, we typically get the, the gut microbiome labs back first. And I can often see what is going on from a hormonal standpoint based on the gut microbiome labs. So I always think that that's... Um, just so fascinating to see how our gut microbiome impacts our hormones. So when we have unhelpful bacteria in the gut, they make something called beta glucuronidase, which we can actually measure here. And just to know that this substance, this beta glucuronidase that these harmful bacteria make, make it so that estrogen doesn't get all the way out of our bodies. So estrogen is, is pretty much like any other toxin. We don't want old hormones floating around in our body and building up, but in the presence of the harmful bacteria that produce this beta glucuronidase, that is exactly what will happen. We'll be dealing with recirculating old hormones, influencing the way we feel. So that it causes what's known as an estrogen dominance. Uh, picture. So if you're someone that gets really bad PMS, really painful periods, terrible mood swings, tender breasts, irritability, even um, things like fibroids or PCOS are related to an estrogen dominant picture. And this can certainly play a role in that. So just to know that your, your gut microbiome can strongly influence your hormonal picture. And this is one of the main reasons why women, even who are in perimenopause can really still experience these estrogen dominant symptoms, even worse than when they were cycling regularly, because the progesterone will start to drop first in perimenopause. And if the estrogen is high because of this gut microbiome imbalance, it can really cause a lot of discomfort for people in, in the perimenopausal stage, because with hormones, we're not looking at actual numbers to be in a certain range necessarily. What we're looking for is we want the estrogen and the progesterone to be balanced. And so finally, stress and the microbiome. So the communication pathway between ourselves and our gut microbiome is a two-way street. We're not only giving the microbiome information, it is giving our bodies information as well. So we communicate with and regulate one another. I, I don't know why this is the part of being a human being that just makes me feel the most fascinated and excited. It's, it's not just what we're doing on our own as like a sterile single organism. We are living interaction. And this is like such a cool example of that is that we're, it's a two-way street. We talk to our microbiome, even though we don't pay attention to that necessarily. And it's talking to us and giving us instructions all the time. So when we're under stress and we increase our sugar and our carbs, uh, you know, stress eating is a super common way to handle, you know, feeling uncertain about the future or just not being able to really handle the heavy load that we have, which is something that we're universally dealing with these days. Um, but when we eat that sugar and carbs as a response to the stress, it will nourish the harmful bacteria in the gut and then to take that a step further, potentially causing hormonal imbalances. 
And to take that one step further, you know, when your estrogen levels go higher, so does histamine. So if any of this histamine information has resonated for you, um, just know that, you know, that can go all the way down the line to histamine intolerance. So when we are depressed or anxious or stressed out, that actually influences the composition of the bugs that are living in our gut. In other words, we're talking about the diverse microbiome that we want and the, the bugs that are actually growing in there are a result of, you know, what our stress level is as well. And also because it, our stress will have a, um, impact on how inflamed we are and how hospitable our gut microbiome, our gut lining is for healthy bugs. So when we have too many harmful bacteria, they actually release toxins in our bodies, metabolites, they are living in the gut. And so they are, they have their own metabolism as well. And that metabolism produces toxins and neurohormones that change how we feel. And when we feel differently, we eat differently. And certain species of microbes have actually been shown to cause unhealthy eating habits. I, especially with yeast overgrowth, I like to make people aware that, you know, sometimes their cravings are not their own. It's coming from the community of yeast and other organisms that are living in the gut, sort of driving these sensations. They're hungry. They want the sugar and they want the carbs. And one of the reasons it can be really hard to make a change in the beginning towards eating healthy food is because you have all those organisms in your body that really want you to feed them what they're used to you eating. And so when you're trying to shift away from eating processed food, for example, and towards a more whole foods diet, you actually have to kind of force yourself to do it in the beginning to just say like, I'm going to make this choice because I know it's good for me, even though it's not what I'm craving or what I'm wanting to have in this moment. Like think when we're stressed, and depressed, it's rare that we feel like we want to reach for the salad. So sometimes the way to make the practical way to make the change is just to take a deep breath and start making one choice at a time and know that every choice matters. We don't have to be perfect at it, but we can change the composition of the microorganisms living in our gut and therefore change the way we think and feel by making one simple choice at a time, just because we know somewhere deep inside that if we make those changes one at a time, we can influence our health and the way we feel over time. Um, and high quality probiotics can be a way to sort of jumpstart that. So taking a high quality probiotic will, like I said, those probiotics are not going to make permanent, uh, house in our gut, but they can help us kind of make that bridge from depressed and anxious and not really able to make good food choices because it's really hard during those times towards making good choices just because it can give us that kind of jump start with those healthy bugs living in the gut. So the impact of stress is that our digestion is impaired. We, we don't have good stomach acid, so we're not breaking down nutrients. When we are lacking good stomach acid, it allows the growth of bad organisms in our gut. It slows down our gastric motility. So we get constipated and we just don't digest food well. I've talked extensively about what that does to the gut microbiome. And as we know, when we have gut permeability or those leaky gut syndrome, it causes inflammation, not only in the gut, but in the whole body, our immunity becomes impaired. And then we're sick all the time on top of it. We develop food sensitivities. So then we're dealing with headaches and rashes and poor sleep. Um, and all of that can snowball into depression and anxiety. There's lots of different roads that lead to the same place um, when the root cause is stress. And quite honestly, when I work with clients um, and look at their labs, it becomes apparent that stress is pretty much the root cause for most people. And it's the hardest thing to work on. A lot of people, especially with Stephanie's help, sail right through the dietary recommendations, but making the lifestyle changes is the hardest thing 
So again, just putting one foot in front of the other and making a good choice without thinking about perfection or doing it right 100% of the time. Absolutely, every single choice matters and influences what's happening in your body. In the Facebook group this morning, I put a document called Strategies for Transforming Stress, and it has a bunch of ideas on little things that we can do to help us in those moments. And, you know, sometimes, again, it can be really hard just to take that step, um, but there's lots of ideas there. And if we find ourselves in that moment of complete overwhelm, it can be helpful just to pull that resource out and just choose something to do. Or maybe you have your favorite activity that you know helps you when you're in those moments, just getting outside and getting some sun on our faces is a number one way to kind of change our mood or listen to music. Um, but if you feel like stress is not manageable or you're looking for some help with it, an action step from day number four of the gut health challenge would be to take a look at that handout and put into action just one of those choices. Um, feed the bugs that will help you feel good by trying to do a nutritious diet 80% of the time. Think about eating that rainbow and it will over time cha completely change the microorganisms that are living in your body and interacting with you and, and uh, giving your body instructions on making neurohormones like dopamine and serotonin and stuff like that. So um, just one, one little thing at a time, one salad at a time or one veg at a time. Uh, and then at use, if you love it, use Stephanie's uh, meal planning prep guide to just spend five to 10 minutes a day uh, making food ahead of time, focusing on food. This is for me, the biggest way to tell my body that I care about it is with meal planning and meal prepping of all the things. This is what I consider to be self-care that is the most meaningful and nourishing. So if you're thinking about meal prep in kind of a task oriented way, like I don't want to spend the time doing that. I don't have time for it. If you have to make a choice for self-care, in my opinion, this is the number one choice to make. Consider good probiotics or other supplementation. Like I said, sometimes the supplements and the probiotics can help us move in the right direction so that we can start to think more clearly, feel more clear-minded and get motivation to do the other things that, that take our energy in order to do it. And then of course, optimizing stomach acidity. And my disclaimer that this is not medical advice for you, it is simply ways to optimize your life. Uh, let me see how to, oh, there we go. All right. Any questions? That was great. I'm looking forward to checking out the stress guide and picking something for today and tomorrow. That can be helpful just to have like a yeah. tool to go to. It's you know, I feel like stress and anxiety sort of come in waves in our lives, mm -hmm. in our lives, depending on what's going on. And when it gets to be a little bit overwhelming, it can be harder to break out of it unless we have a tool set, a skill set already established for ourselves. So it's a good idea to practice when we're feeling good, as well as when we're not feeling good. And that way we have something to draw upon when we need to. Yeah, make it a habit. <laughs> All right, I can wrap it up if that's that's it. Thank you for the the live the person who joined us live. We really appreciate that. And tomorrow is the last day. Don't forget to use your fall 20 coupon in the e-store if you want to buy supplements, if you want personalized recommendations, I'm happy to do that. Your 20% off goes for anything in the e-store. And yeah, looking forward to wrap up tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.